And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation. And it shall be a statute forever in your generation. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, a new series of programs offered as a public service. This program is prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Chapter 2 is entitled Emmanuel. God is with us, and is written by Morton Wishengrad. Following the dramatic portion of the program, you will hear a talk by Dr. Samuel H. Goldenson. In October 1944, in conjunction with the Jewish Theological Seminary, NBC began one of the longest-running religious programs in radio history. It was called The Eternal Light. They dramatized stories from ancient Judea, along with contemporary works like the diary of Anne Frank. It was produced by Milton Krentz. Many top New York radio actors appeared. NBC donated the time, and the seminary paid for the show's production. As part of this second episode, which aired on Sunday, October 15, 1944, listeners heard about the founding of Temple Emmanuel, the first Reformed Jewish synagogue in New York. It was formed in 1845 in a rented hall near Grand and Clinton Streets in Manhattan's Lower East Side. By 1944, the congregation had moved to its current location at 1 East 65th Street, just off Fifth Avenue, on Manhattan's Upper East Side. One hundred years ago, 38 Jewish immigrants met on New York's Lower East Side to found the Temple of God. This is the story of one of those 38, one who fled the black night of German persecution in the first half of the 19th century. We dedicate his story to six young men of Temple Emmanuel who in this first half of the 20th century have given their lives in the struggle against German fascism. Major Albert Wertheim. Lieutenant Richard H. Seligman, United States Navy. Lieutenant Gilbert H. Seidenberg. Lieutenant Alan J. Bamberger. Light Officer Robert J. Weiss. Lieutenant Peter H. Lehman. To these six, with deep reverence, we dedicate our story. Fronting the northern ocean, there is a place near Nordenham where the river Weser spills into the sea. Far below, past Brake and Bremen and Hemelingen, is the little town where I was born. Not much of a town, you'll say, yet large enough for three millers to make their flour and two brewers to steep their malt and a few hundred Jews to be enclosed in a ghetto. It was there I was born, and there my father named me Daniel after his father, and there I spent my boyhood, an uneventful boyhood, an uneventful boyhood until one day when my father came home. Ezra, is that you? Rachel. Just in time for potato pudding. I don't want any. 
You're not sick, are you? Rachel, the armies of Napoleon are in Germany. Your potato pudding will get cold, Ezra. Rachel, I said Napoleon. The way you carry on, someone might think the Messiah has come. Rachel, try to understand. The French Revolution has come to Germany. The ghetto walls are broken. The whole world is open to us. I can tear off this badge. I can walk freely on a road. I can do anything. Don't get excited, Ezra. It makes you sick to your stomach. I'm not sick to my stomach. Then why don't you eat your potato pudding? Oh, Rachel, your brain has turned to potato pudding. Listen, from now on, everything will be different. Different for you and for me and for our children. Different for our people. Rachel, a new world's begun. And it was true. A new world had begun. It was as though the Messiah had come to the ghetto and broken the walls and said, See, my children, the grass is fresh and green, and there beyond grows a flower. It grows also for you. This is how it seemed to us. And this is how it must have seemed to all the Jews of Europe, liberated by the armies of the French Revolution. It was a happy time, and for my father and mother, there was even greater cause for happiness. She's a fine little girl, Rachel. Your hand under her head more, Ezra. Am I holding her right? Mm, yes, that's better. You know, I think she's not ugly. Oh, I'm glad. It's a good sign. Is it? I think so. And she's born at a good time, Ezra. Thank God she'll never see a ghetto wall. I thought of that every moment, Ezra. And it eased the pain. Oh, Ezra, now it's good to be alive. Good to be alive and to be a Jew and to live in Germany. Yes, it was good to be alive and to be a Jew and to live in Germany. And in the years that passed, there was nothing to mar that goodness. No wall stood beyond our window. No badge was sewed on my father's coat. Esther, my sister grew and was gray-eyed under her Sabbath bonnet. And then one day when my father was speaking to the burgomaster, who was not an unfriendly man, suddenly the old fear rose like a specter from the ground. Don't you enjoy my conversation, Ezra? Excuse me, Herr Burgermeister, I didn't intend to be rude. What has upset you? All the news is good. Napoleon is beaten, the German states are free again. The Vienna Congress is bringing back law and order. Rejoice, Ezra, the French tyrant has fallen. Will I also rejoice in the German tyrant who takes his place? Don't speak nonsense, Ezra. Say what you mean. Napoleon's fall has been a signal, Herr Burgermeister. A signal for an old evil to begin again. Ezra, your words walk on stilts. What do you mean? Are you blind, Herr Burgermeister? They've already begun to shout anti-Jewish slogans in the public square. Just a few hoodlums. They don't speak for me. They don't speak for any decent German. I hope you're right. Now, if you'll excuse me, Herr Burgermeister, I want to go home and tell my wife to bolt the shutters. All right, Ezra, we'll keep indoors. It's best, Rachel. Daniel, you'll stay close to Esther. Yes, Father. Now let's go to bed. Father, do you know Latin? What's that, Daniel? At school, the older boys keep yelling, Hiro Salama est paradita. Don't trouble your father, Daniel. Go to bed. It's all right, Rachel. So that's what the boys are yelling, Daniel? Yes, Father. It means Jerusalem is destroyed. Why do they say it to me? I'm a German. You're also a Jew, Daniel. Is that a crime, Father? Yes, Daniel. In Germany, it's a crime. I'll go to bed. <gasps> Please don't cry, Rachel. All right, Ezra. I won't cry anymore. It's hardest on you, isn't it? No, Ezra. I can bear it. I think I can bear anything for myself, and I can bear it for you and for Daniel. 
But not for Esther, not for the little one. No. Today she was walking on the footpath. A little girl in a bonnet. Just walking. They they told her to walk in the gutter. That's law and order, Rachel. They were civic-minded. Yes, henceforth Jews may not walk on the footpath. Even very small Jews. But how does she offend them, Ezra? She's still a baby. I don't know, Rachel. I don't know anything anymore. Bend thy head a moment, Ezra. Till the storm is past. No bending, Rachel. No bending, no bowing, no cringing. Where are you going? The only place I can go. A man can't stand alone, Rachel. Not in this world. I'm going to take my place with the others. Rachel, I'm going to the synagogue. I went with my father. They would not let us meet in the old synagogue. It was no longer permitted that Jews might pray above street level. So we came together in a cellar with one cell-like window staring at the street. And the rabbi looked silently at the window and then turned to my father. I think I don't mind the cellar, Ezra. But I mind, rabbi. No, you shouldn't. We have gone down to worship in order to fulfill the injunction of the psalmist. Out of the depths have we cried unto the Lord, and he answered us. Will he not answer us again, Ezra? I don't know, Rabbi. I think perhaps I don't care. There's answer enough for me in the strength of my own hands. No, Ezra. There is no answer in any man's hands. They are not strong enough to tear down the wall that must be broken. And your fists cannot do it. I don't believe it. I don't believe you. You preach peace and there is no peace. You preach rest and there is no rest. There is no gladness, no honor, no joy in life. It's all illusion. Ezra, if a man is at peace with God, then he is at peace with himself and he has rest and honor and joy in life. Even in the ghetto? Even in Gehenna. Believe that, Ezra, and do justly and be steadfast. And you will live, Ezra, because... That is how Judaism has always lived. There's nothing I can do for you, Ezra. You misunderstand. I want nothing for myself, Herr Burgermeister. I ask for all of us. If I can do nothing for you, I can do even less for them. That isn't true, Herr Burgermeister. Perhaps you can't take the badge from my sleeve, but there are other humiliations. You don't know what you're asking. I'm asking you to save us from further degradation. My hands are tied, Ezra. I see. I'm sorry, Ezra. All right. Listen, my friend, don't you think I understand? But I'm a public servant. I can't defend you. I don't ask anyone to defend us. What then? I ask for someone, anyone, you or the priest or the miller or any villager, anyone, any decent, civilized German. I ask him to say, people, what you do against the Jew is wrong. What you do against the Jew is monstrous, monstrous and unchristian. That's all I ask. It wouldn't help, Ezra. It would. It would help very much to have faith again. Even faith in you, Herr Burgermeister. Suppose I told you that I'm terribly sorry for you, yes, and for your people. Your actions speak so loud I can't hear what you say. That's unfair, Ezra. You know I'm a tolerant man. You know I tolerate your religion. What do you mean you tolerate? Who gives you the right to tolerate or not to tolerate? I don't like your tone, Ezra. I'm sorry. But I don't like to be condescended to. I didn't come for tolerance. I came as a German citizen and I asked for ordinary human rights. There's no point in discussing this anymore. You'll lose your temper, I'll lose my temper, and I'm a reasonable man. So the answer is, Ezra, pray to God that things stay as they are. Or if they change, it will only be for the worse. Ezra, don't be distressed. We'll come out of this. Somehow we always do. Do you know something, Rachel? You're not even listening. I can't abide it anymore. What? What can't you abide? Germany. It seems corrupt to the very marrow of the bone. 
It's where you were born, Ezra. It's not where I'll die, Rachel. Oh, Ezra, no. Rachel, please don't cry. You're going to America, aren't you? There's no alternative. No. No, there's no alternative. You're going alone, aren't you? There's money enough for only one passage. You know that. It's too much, Ezra, more than I can bear. Don't cry, Rachel. If you want me to, I'll stay. Please don't cry. That's why I'm crying. Because you mustn't stay. Because our hope is for you to go. And for you to send for us. That's all the hope we have left. God bless you, Rachel. The rabbi has promised to look after you. I'll send for you soon. Oh, Ezra. Believe me, Rachel, it will be soon. I think there was something in the American air he loved at once. Something with space and cleanliness in it. And he wrote us letters filled with pride in the new land. And he sent for us with pride. Now that we're here, I cannot tell you how good it is. Nor can I tell you how good it has been these 20 full years in a still growing union. My uh, father and mother are old now, but if I grow old like them, I'll bless the Lord. Daniel, what's in the paper about Texas? Oh, they say she'll join the union. May I live to see it. And who's going to be elected mayor? Mr. Selden or that loco foco, what's his name? <laughs> well, the Herald's for Selden, Father. A good paper, Daniel. A very good paper. Now, I'll, I'll tell you something that isn't in the paper. Mm -hmm. We've organized a synagogue. Yes? Taking a place on Grand and Clinton, right over a store. You got a rabbi? Mm -hmm. We're going to pay him $4 a week. Dr. Leo Metzbacher, he's a fine man. Mm -hmm. Very pleased, Daniel. I knew you'd be. You like the name we've chosen also? Yes. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God is with us. I like it very much, Daniel. I hoped you would. Tell me about this rabbi. Will he preach this Sabbath? Well, yes, of course. You think he's found a text for his sermon? <laughs> I couldn't say, Father. Well, then perhaps, Daniel, he won't mind if I suggest a text for America and Emmanuel. Go to him, Daniel, and wish him well. And tell him for me that this land is like an ensign set on a high mountain. I'll tell him, Father. And let him look in Isaiah, in the 27th chapter. Yes, Father. I should like him to read that, Daniel. And they shall come that were lost in the land of Assyria. And they that were dispersed in the land of Egypt. And they shall worship the Lord. We continue our program with a brief message by Dr. Samuel H. Goldenson, one of the nation's distinguished religious leaders and rabbi of the Temple Emmanuel of New York City. Dr. Goldenson. It is now nearly 100 years since the little band of Jews hailing from Germany gathered together in their first and very humble place of worship in this city. The establishment of their congregation was to them, as it has been to the children of Israel throughout the ages, the most significant and compelling enterprise. They knew that without the synagogue, as the bearer of the religious traditions of their fathers, they could not realize the best in them and could not play their historic role in the spiritual life of mankind. It was because these men understood the high function of the synagogue in the life of Israel 
and also because they were so deeply grateful to find themselves in a land so favorable to their hopes and yearnings that they named their congregation Emmanuel, God is with us. The name is both a prayer and a resolution. It is a thankful acknowledgement of God's grace and goodness in making it possible for them to live in a land where they could enjoy freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of worship. At the same time, the name of the congregation voiced their fervid determination to carry the torch of their faith on this blessed land as their forefathers had done in every land and in all ages throughout their long history. To what extent the early hopes and dreams of the fathers of Temple Emmanuel were realized, no one knows. Spiritual endeavors can never be actually gauged and measured. Religion deals with the purposes that cannot be fully accomplished and with ideals that can never be altogether achieved. Yet it is gratifying to be able to record that from the very beginning, the men and women of this congregation have been leaders in the upbuilding of every Jewish benevolent educational and social service institution in this community. Our hospitals, orphan asylums, homes for the aged, relief agencies, cultural centers, and religious schools were all of them, almost without exception, sponsored, supported, and maintained in great part by the men and women of Congregation Emmanuel. Nor did our people give themselves wholly and exclusively to Jewish social and cultural endeavors. Among our members will be found numberless persons who have given of their thought, energy, and substance to the furtherance of every high cause in the life of the community and the nation. These patriotic services and humane contributions to the well-being of our fellow Jews and of our neighbors are not a chance, an accidental expression of the generous instincts of the members of Temple Emmanuel. They are rather the direct outgrowth and traditional exemplification of the teachings of the synagogue. Judaism has always insisted that doctrine and deed must go together. It is of the very essence of the religion of Israel that the thought of God and the contemplation of the moral law should issue in right conduct and beneficent behavior. Indeed, the third commandment enjoins that no one shall take the name of the Lord in vain, that is, in such a way as not to make it count for good amid the actualities of life. It is with joy and thankfulness, therefore, that we approach the 100th anniversary of Temple Emmanuel, for we hope and believe that its members will, in the future, give themselves to all manner of good works as they have done in the past. Thus will they maintain the congregation as an exemplar of the faith of Israel and a force for good in our midst. Thank you, Dr. Goldenson. Beshamru, a selection from the musical literary of Temple Emmanuel, will now be sung by cantor David Putterman and the choir. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
You have just heard the second in a series of programs entitled The Eternal Light, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. This program was prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. The script was written by Wart Morton Wishengrad and directed by Ira Avery. The music was conducted by Henri Nosko. The traditional liturgical music was sung by cantor David Putterman in the choir. The talk was delivered by Dr. Samuel H. Goldenson. Copies of today's script may be secured without cost by writing to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York, 27, New York. This program came to you from New York City. This is the National Broadcasting Company.